I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, where we discuss the ideas, people, and events that have made America what it is today. We believe that by understanding our history and our principles, we can better live up to the promise of the American founding and preserve our ongoing experiment in self-government. Welcome to The American Idea. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of The American Idea. I'm your host, John Moser. I'm chair of the Department of History and Political Science at Ashland University. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, uh, a very important event in the Second World War that occurred 80 years ago this month. Uh, this was uh, known by its codename Operation Galvanic. And on November 20th, 1943, U.S. Marines stormed the beaches of an island called Tarawa, which was held by about 5,000 Japanese troops. The result was a four-day battle that would be one of the costliest engagements of the war, which has gone down in history as Bloody Tarawa. And here to talk about it today is Dr. Thomas Bruschino. Dr. Thomas Bruschino is Professor of History in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations at the United States Army War College. He has a PhD in Military History from Ohio University, go Bobcats. He previously worked at the U.S. Army Center of Military History, the U.S. Army Combat Studies Institute, and the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies. Dr. Bruschino is author of A Nation Forged in War, How World War II Taught Americans to Get Along, that was published in 2010, and Out of Bounds, Transnational Sanctuary in Irregular Warfare, uh, that was published in 2006. He is currently working on a history of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive of 1918. Tom Bruschino, thank you for being with us. Glad to be here. Tarawa. Why Tarawa? How does it? How did that fit in with with uh, the overall U.S. strategy for the Pacific? All right. So, as an Army War College guy, these uh, strategic issues are of uh, great importance to us and are very detailed. Uh, and and the Pacific War, in particular, I think doesn't maybe get enough uh, get enough credit yeah. or uh, thought put into it. It's it's enormously complicated. So, but the basic background on 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 Tarawa and why it happens uh, is that you know, the overall strategy for the uh, United States in World War II and the Allies, along with the Allies, in particular Great Britain, was to do Europe first, uh, Germany first. Uh, so the idea was that in, uh, initially, at least, the Pacific would be the kind of economy of force, uh, and then they would follow on once defeated Germany, then they would uh, turn their full efforts to Japan. Uh, that said, uh, events kind of overtook that. I think American production ramped up a little faster than uh, than even they expected, and and so there were some opportunities. And this kind of started with Casablanca, the Casablanca Conference in January of '43. Uh, it's still Europe first, uh, but then they started talking a lot more about Pacific options uh, and and the efforts they would do in the Pacific, sort of following on with uh, some of the advantages they gained in the Battle of Coral Sea and Midway in 1942. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, following that up, they did another conference in Washington, the, uh, the, the so-called Trident Conference in May of 43, uh, and it, that one is just mostly focused on, on Europe issues. Uh, they also decided that uh, for the Pacific, they would go with a uh, sort of a dual-pronged attack towards, uh, towards Japan. Now, the big picture, the big idea of defeating Japan would be uh, to, to cut them off navally first, right? That was the idea. Uh, submarine warfare began from the very beginning, but then be able to get the uh, uh, use a combination of of land, sea, and air uh, attacks to uh, cut Japan off from its resources, particularly in Southeast Asia um, and and in the Southwest Pacific. Uh, and at that point, perhaps Japanese would give up. If it didn't if that didn't work, then the next option would be to, to bomb Japan directly. Let, uh, let, let me introduce you for for just a moment. Sure. There's a, there, there's a two pronged defensive plan. That would seem to me to be in violation of one of the basic rules of warfare that says never divide your forces in the presence of the enemy. 
Why did the Allied, uh, Allied Supreme Command decide on such an approach? Yeah, so the, the problem was, uh, is that the, the, the initial main effort, which was the Southwest Pacific area, which is under D Douglas MacArthur, this kind of oriented out of Australia, and then heading towards uh, New Guinea, and then on its way to the Philippines, and maybe Formosa, Taiwan, um, is, a much more, is, is an extremely difficult path. It's also, um, if you kind of look at a map, it's, it's unprotected uh, by the, on its northern flank. The Japanese, uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, took uh, all these, this is a huge number of island chains in what the Americans would eventually call the Central Pacific area. Um, these included, so if you kind of imagine this giant rectangle going from the west coast of North America, uh, the northern boundary is, is, includes most of the Japanese islands, the southern boundary is about the equator. Uh, which puts it right on the sort of northern uh, edge of New Guinea. Um, so that's uh, you know, it's, uh, separate from MacArthur's area. And then you have these series of islands in particular of importance, almost, you know, Hawaii is kind of right in the middle of this big rectangle. And pretty much straight to the west of it is the Marshall Islands. Uh, and in the Marshalls, you have like Kwajalein is the sort of main, main area. Then just to the west of that is, uh, and again, just to the west in the Pacific is hundreds of miles, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Nearly thousands, the Pacific is gigantic. Then you have the Carolines and in particular a base called Truck, which would be, an, it would be important. And then just to the north of the Carolines, northwest of the Carolines is the Marianas where you have Saipan, uh, which place, and, and you needed all of these uh, just as a basic thing to protect, uh, to protect that the, the northern flank of the, of the advance through New Guinea towards the Philippines. So it made a lot of sense. And not only did they decide to, to focus on the Central Pacific, they actually identified it as their main effort. Mm. That this would be the, the, the main effort in, in this fight. Um, you know, some really interesting reasons for that. Some of it is just because um, the environment in, in, the, in the Solomon Islands, which is by New Guinea and in New Guinea itself is uh, you know, a lot more tropical, a lot more uh, tougher on the troops. You know, a lot of pests, bugs, uh, whereas the Central Pacific, uh, you know, these atolls are are kind of a different environment. They're hot and and limited, but they don't have that same kind of uh, malarial type environment. Oh. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why they think it's, a, it's something we should do. Be, be, besides the fact they need all of these these spaces. Um, in addition, uh, they're they're also the it's it's straighter, right? It's it's uh, a little bit more direct, and every mile counts, especially when you're talking about these vast differences in the Pacific, distances in the Pacific, and, and, and you know, and, and throw onto that too, that some of these islands, you know, south of the, of the uh, Marshall Islands are the Gilbert Islands, which is where Tar Tarawa is, Tarawa Atoll is, and that kind of sits along the, the line of communications from the United States to Australia. Uh, so that's a serious problem uh, for resources. So they need to, they need to do something about it. Was, um, was there any element of of inter-service rivalry that went into this? I mean, after all, the Southwestern Pacific campaign was largely an army show, and uh, the navy the navy wanted its own area of operations. Yeah, so the in, in general, it is an army show with that with uh, naval fleets in support of MacArthur, um, but that also sort of. You know, we can overplay that, right? There's a, certainly from MacArthur's perspective, he wants it to be the main effort. He thinks, you know, this is, you know, he promises to return to the Philippines. So he's always focused on Luzon in particular and getting to Man back to Manila in the Philippines. Um, and he wants uh, to be a major part of whatever fight happens. Uh, this is a, a perpetual issue. It's an issue right now with the focus on China uh, for the United States military is, you know, what is the role of land forces in that fight? Uh, it was pri primarily a maritime theater. Uh, but, you know, they, I think they all kind of see, or certainly the Joint Chiefs see, that uh, that they need to be mutually supporting. So they kind of put that into their uh, into their view. And also, there's ability, if, if you take these Central Pacific Islands, you can kind of go back and forth between, you can send those fleets to support MacArthur, that you can sort of uh, sequence your activities so that you can go back and forth with these fast carriers in support of going back and forth. So it, it's a lot more about cooperation than competition. Mm -hmm among the services, even though we like the story of MacArthur being MacArthur. <laughs> so, uh, so back to Terrell, what, what, what is specifically important about that island? So what's, what's important about this is that there was no real easy way to get to, so the, the, the objective really is the Marshalls and the Carolines, so Kwajalein and Truck, uh, Saipan and the, and the Marianas, 
all this big area called Micronesia. Uh, but the problem was they couldn't really reach or see uh, see the marshals particularly well. You know, up until you know most of the, like I said, the Japanese had taken and fortified these islands um, in in 1942. Uh, Americans Marines had done a raid on Macon, um, which in, in the that's in the the Gilbert Island group. Uh, it's in the Tarawa, uh, uh, near Tarawa, and in with uh, when they do the raid on Macon, the Japanese start to reinforce all of these islands, but they can't really see what they're doing in all these different islands and what they've done on Kwajalein, what they've done in these various other places that they might use. Um, they're all sort of small, uh, you know, island chains made up of atolls, coral atolls, uh, almost exclusively. Uh, so, like the best they could see was with submarines. And, you know, so submarines popping up periscope and you've got this kind of low angle view and you can't really tell what's going on, how built up they are. So they needed air bases um, and really uh, so they could get overflight of them. But it was the range was too far to really see anything. So they actually needed the Gilberts first because uh, the, the Gilberts would allow them to project into the into the Marshalls and then so on into the Carolines and the Marianas beyond. So it's kind of a sequence thing that it kind of has to happen to make it happen. So they have to go to the Gilberts first. Um, they wow. wouldn't like to necessarily, but the, but it is required. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Um, well, obviously, this was not the first occasion in which U.S. and Japanese land forces had faced one another. Um, what's different about Tarawa? So what is different is that they're atolls, right? So this is the this is the major difference uh, that are in them. So there are these these small coral atolls. I mean, they're tiny. It's uh, what is it, 300, 300 square acres or something of the. So the island that they're focused on, and so we call it Tarawa because it's or Tarawa or Tarawa for different name pronunciations of it. All of these islands are hard to pronounce. Um, the the main uh, atoll that they're focused on, the specific island that, that they're focused on, is is called Basio. Uh, that's the one where the the action will probably talk about, but it's also Macon is in the Gilbert Island group too, the Macon Atoll. Um, and there's like a series of like strung together uh, atolls that are in there. So the atolls themselves are a different environment. Uh, they're very small, um, uh, unlike say Guadalcanal, uh, which is an island itself that they, 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 they can use, uh, they can fight on, which sort of looks like a little bit more familiar environment. Uh, a little bit harder to concentrate defensive forces on. You can't help but concentrate on these atolls because they're small. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so they're a different thing. And then, and then they have these, you know, extensive reefs around them. Um, and just the nature of the guilt, the island groups and the atolls themselves. There's very limited ways to get in and out of them. Uh, you know, because the ships can uh, ships have only certain paths in and out of them. So it makes it really difficult. You're kind of canalized with what you're doing. Uh, when you're bringing ships to try and do these amphibious attacks hmm. um so and this is this is a really heavily defended island as well right yeah so that you know so to kind of get to the one of the main questions of it um the japanese so after the raid that carlson does in 42 the japanese reinforce these things and really start to to build up these defenses of these islands and so they spend, you know, they spend over a year building up the defenses on on uh, on all of these uh, atolls, but particularly Basio, which they identify as a, as vitally important to the Gilbert Island group, to the Tarawa Atoll itself. Uh, and yeah, so the defenses are ridiculous. It's basically the entire island is is ringed with uh, block houses. They're they're covered by coral sand. Uh, they're really hard to get at. Um, the nature of Basio Island itself is um, uh, sort of supports this defensive plan. They have the way it, the, the island kind of uh, looks, it kind of looks like a comma uh, is almost a better way, way to describe it. Um, and it's also ringed by mines, uh, naval mines in, in the water. And the only place that there aren't mines, and they do a pretty good job of figuring this out once they're able to, to get some uh, air uh, they get some very good uh, reconnaissance of, of the island and they figure out that there's mines all around it, except on the northern portion of it, uh, which is this big lagoon that's uh, kind of a semicircle, um, you know, concaved in so that the defense is so you can only approach over this lagoon, but it's, the lagoon is, has a high reef on it. Uh, so it's the only really way to approach that's not mined with ships, um, but then you run into the problem of having a reef 
uh, that that goes out and is is just you know under the water, so you can't actually bring ships up to the up to the beach, like those so this type is, of landing boats. This is a, a a daunting task for the for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, I I I I was reading that the Japanese commander had said that the Americans wouldn't be able to take it uh, to would not be able to take Tarawa with a million men with in a hundred years. So yeah, so the, yeah, the yeah, Japanese how, tend to I use mean, these. What steps do they? What, what steps does uh, do, do, do the U.S. commanders put into play to 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 do this? All right, so they they uh, the the primary uh, force for this ends up being the. Um, I mean, it's a big, complicated command structure. Um, you know, fleets with a, a the Second Marine Division, which had experience in Guadalcanal and went and did training in in New Zealand. And now now that at the same time as they do. Uh, Basio, they also do Macon. Uh, so they do Tarawa and they do Macon at the same time. The Macon is actually an army, uh, 26th division, I believe, that comes out of that comes out of uh, Honolulu for the attack. Um, but yeah, it's a massive effort to bring in, to bring in ships, uh, air, uh, fast carriers, escort carriers, uh, destroyers, uh, battleships as close as they can get them into this fight. Uh, and so they're bringing them all in and, and they focus on a lot of sort of preliminary um, bombardment to try to uh, weaken the defenses. On the American side, their thought is that after the bombardments that they do, both uh, aerial and naval bombardments, is that they'll just walk onto the island mm -hmm. of Beijing itself, or they're kind of hoping that that would be the case. Um, it's one of the kind of lessons that they learn about these atolls and these coral type um environments and how good the japanese are at, at building in their defenses and how difficult they are to do anything with except for direct attacks with things like flamethrowers mm -hmm. grenades uh you know this very very direct fire that you have to use on it um and, and the ability to try to get you know tanks and, and artillery and on this island but uh, so they they come up with a bunch of ideas about about how to do this they try to train it it's very difficult because the forces that are engaged, and this is a kind of a common theme in the Pacific War, when we talk about the, you know, how good they are at planning, they have to bring in resources from all over the place, and then kind of concentrate them for the, for the invasion itself, they do this over and over again, which, so there's, you know, benefits to that, you know, they're able to bring in a lot of stuff, but the problem is, is that very, very, they don't have a lot of time to train together. In fact, a lot of times they don't even see each other uh, before, you know, they're doing their training sort of separate. Um, in order to kind of hedge their bets, they know about the reef. They know about the tide problems with the reef, that the the, the tide could be low. Um, and there's this uh, neap tide, they think they call it. And it's this sort of strange tide that comes into it. And it's sort of a benefit and it's a, and it's a hindrance. Uh, because the water's a little lower, the reef is a little bit higher. That means that the Higgins boats, the sort of the ones you kind of see for, you know, D-Day Normandy, uh, they can only get, they can only go up to the reef and then they have to let guys out and then they have to wade uh, on the reef for 300, 400 yards at times, 600 yards at times. Or the other option is that they've developed a new thing that these LVTs, they're amphibious tractors that can both, uh, you know, swim, you know, from their, you know, be uh, taken off of their ships and then swim and get close. And then they're, they have treads like tanks and they can, they can climb over the reef. Uh, and they've got a couple of, they've got the first version of it and they've just started loading the second one and they they bring a lot of them in uh, for this uh, for this fight. But uh, none of that actually solves the problem of that when they get on this reef, they're kind of surrounded by, almost on three sides by Japanese uh, pre-sighted uh, uh, fire anti-aircraft machine guns that are actually better against, uh, that are kind of useless against airplanes, but are actually really good against um, the LVTs, uh, they're lightly armored. Both editions, the, the LVT ones and twos, are both lightly armored. So they're, uh, it's, it's a it's a massive problem that they're trying to deal with. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. Hi, this is John Moser, chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. If you are an educator who teaches U.S. history, government, or politics, our program may be just what you've been looking for. Our approach is to emphasize primary sources, since we think the best way to study the past is to read the words of those who lived it. We have a distinguished faculty made up of professors from both Ashland University and from colleges and universities across the country. And they're not there to lecture to you. 
we think it's better to learn through conversation about the documents. Ours is a hybrid program with two different types of seminar. The first are our week-long intensive in-person courses during the summers on the beautiful campus of Ashland University. The second are our live synchronous online seminars offered throughout the year. So if you're a social studies teacher and you're looking to deepen your understanding of America's past and its politics, please check out the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. You can do that by visiting tah.org slash programs. So that, that helps us to explain why the, uh, why the casualties were so high, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's brutal. They, the, as they, as they, uh, they come off and they, they land on a series of beaches, they're kind of red, red one, one through three on the Northern side of the Island. And then there's a green beach. that's on the Western side of the Island, um, that they go and then black beach is the Southern one. And they decide not to, not to land at black beach because of the mines, uh, the naval mines that are off of, uh, off of the Island or the atoll itself off of Batio itself. Uh, so they're kind of they're kind of canalized into this, like I said, into this like semicircle of fire that's happening uh, that they that they run into, and um, and it just turns into and the tide is lower than they think. So the Higgins boats themselves, they have to the guys have to d get off of them earlier. The LVTs, as good as they as as effective as they are um, as for traversing a reef, and they're and they are good. Uh, they they just get riddled. Um, with these pre-sighted fires and the, and the initial bombardment is kind of short. They decide to kind of emphasize, uh, it's like two and a half or three hours long. They try to emphasize surprise over, you know, over saturating the fires. Um, and it's, and it, and it turns out that the naval fire is only of, of limited effectiveness, uh, given the, the, the hardiness of the Japanese, uh, positions. So, uh, so if, if, if you're, th this is, this puzzles me a bit. It's only a two and a half hour bombardment, but it seems to me that th that's not that 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 is a is a short window of time compared to what it could be, but still not enough. Uh, there, there's still plenty of time to uh, to avoid for the Japanese not to be surprised. In other words, so if they've been shelled for two and a half hours, they've got to think that something's coming, right? Well, I mean, part of the problem is, and we kind of, you know, it truly is a joint operation. So the Japanese have plans themselves. They have naval bases uh, strung out throughout all of these different islands, in the Carolines, in the Marshalls, in the Gilberts, uh, Marianas, and they have plans to bring in naval forces to attack. The problem is that the fleet has to stick around, you know, in support of this landing for a long time. And, and, you know, Japanese submarines, Japanese ships, uh, carriers, whatever could show up. Now they're limited somewhat by the, on the carrier front because of Midway, uh, but they still have lots and lots of assets that they can bring in bombers and things. So if they get word out that this, this attack is happening, the Japanese counterattack starts to happen and, 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 you know, naval counterattack from other islands. And then the fleet is kind of exposed. It's, it's stuck. Like I said, you're, you're kind of stuck in certain areas in order to support. They have to linger. This is what happened at Guadalcanal. Uh, mm -hmm. Is what they're really concerned about that happened at Guadalcanal is that the ships had to stick around to help, uh, you know, and sort of famously at Guadalcanal, they had to leave at times. Uh, so that, you know, so the, the Marines on Guadalcanal didn't have naval gunfire support for, you know, and, or air support for, you know, significant periods while they're, while they're fighting and trying to hold uh, the, the beachhead. Uh, so they're kind of aware of, they're aware of that. So there's, there's kind of, a, you always feel like there's a clock ticking on how fast yeah. these have to happen. Yeah. So what would you say are the, the keys to the eventual U.S. victory as costly as it was? All right. So even though we've kind of been bagging on the naval gunfire, as it turns out uh, on the afternoon, so they land on, on no, uh, November 20th, it's a little bit delayed. And then it's obviously all of the delays of trying to get into the, uh, trying to get onto the, you know, over the reef and onto the beach. There's a big long pier that sticks out uh, that, that's, uh, that is, is helpful, but um, they end up getting kind of stuck against that. They're, they're stuck in all kinds of positions on these various beaches. I mean, they're holding, very little ground uh, and we measured in yards uh, that they're holding on this. However, on the afternoon of, uh, they, they think it's sort of unclear by the record, but um, they think on the afternoon, the, the main Japanese commander on the island tries to move his command post. And when he's, when he leaves his command post, he gets 
hit by a him a tank that's near him and everything gets hit by a um uh a japanese tank gets hit by a naval gunfire and he's killed oh. uh which is uh sort of with already having command and control issues on the island a japanese communicating with each other but then when they lose him uh you know so any kind of counterattack they're able to do on the night of of november 20th uh, is is kind of broken up it's, it's sort of sort of hard to say who's in charge um at that point there's a series of kind of pockets of of japanese uh fighters and then they're all kind of like i said lined up in all these block houses uh that said they're they're able to to just hang on um on the night of the 20th uh in, in you know and into the 21st on some of these beaches uh, on either side of that pier uh, they do in the pocket itself that's in the main part of the lagoon they they're they're barely barely hanging on there and then uh, you know over the next you know by the day two they're actually able to uh, have some success on the western side of the island on green beach which wasn't the main effort but that allowed them to start getting an advantage mm-hmm. in the fighting um, and the marines themselves are just tenacious in the fight right that that's a that's a huge part of the fight i mean the, i think it's four medals of honor you know, you know, in four days, uh, three of them posthumous. Uh, one of the commanders that's on the ground does a, does a good job of, and he gets he gets uh, the, the, uh, he is he is awarded the Medal of Honor, also, for the fight. He's the only survivor. And they suffer about a thousand casualties, right? Yeah, it's brutal. Another two thousand wounded out yeah. of something like you know, I think it's something like I can't remember how many total land. They say the total number of Marines involved is eighteen thousand. So it's a, it's a it's a huge casualty figure, uh, you know. And then one of the things that they, you know, that, that becomes apparent that that was already kind of uh, somewhat apparent in Guadalcanal, but but was really driven home on uh, Tarawa and Basio Island was that the Japanese would fight to the last man to the death, mm-hmm. right? So um, you know, of the of the two thousand some two thousand six, you know, some four thousand forty five hundred troops. I'm not counting really the uh, all of the additional sort of labor uh, that is counting some of the additional laborers. It's something like, uh, you know, almost all of them are are killed. There's uh, 17 soldiers captured, something like 120 Korean laborers Mm. who who survived. But otherwise, they all fight to the death, including, you know, the first time seeing a lot of them when they realize that they're that they're going to lose starting to commit uh, suicide. So it's an extremely bloody campaign. The United States is ultimately victorious. What are the lasting impacts of the uh, of this battle? Yeah, so uh, you know, a couple. So you know, in the strategic thing, it works, right? It works the way that they kind of they kind of hoped. It becomes a springboard for them to be able to go into um, go into the Marshall Islands, take Kwajalein, which ends up being really important, and then later on take Truk, which ends up being you know enormously important. Uh, and on their way to Saipan, which, you know, as it turns out, can can be useful for uh, B-29s to actually range and, and bomb uh, bomb Japan directly. So there's there's that kind of aspect of it, uh, which is important. Um, you know, which, it doesn't end the debates about the best approach to Japan, but it does it does pre, uh, create options, right? Mm-hmm. So they can have the argument about whether they need to go, whether they should go to Formosa or go to Luzon. Uh, MacArthur wins that one and they go to Luzon. Uh, in part because China, because part of the overall plan is that China would be a part of the fighting, but China, you know, never is able to really be a a, a significant part of the attack on Japan itself, uh, as they discover over the next uh, couple of years in, in the war. Uh, and then the you know follow on is lessons learned, All right? So there's a lot of lessons learned about Tarawa about how to fight on atolls. So um, it it never gets easy. Uh, I think. I think if there's one thing to learn about this, you know, there's a tendency for people to say, you know, to, to kind of focus on mistakes, shortness of the bombardment, not being aware of the reef and all that other stuff. Truth is that they had thought about all that stuff. Uh, they do get better with a lot of um, a lot of the activities that they that, that they they do in terms of amphibious attacks. But the main reason why it's so difficult is because the Japanese are so good. Yeah. You know, we have a tendency to kind of focus on World War II on like the Germans are the, you know, you know, the the, the major efforts beating the Germans. Um, but Americans actually have much less trouble fighting the Germans, you know, in, in these kind of infantry fights than they do with the Japanese. You know, I think Beisho ends up being kind of a preview. Taro ends up being a preview for even when all the lessons learned and how good they get about combining joint efforts, air, sea, land efforts. Uh, you know, it's something like, you know, Iwo Jima or Okinawa especially. 
the Japanese are still able to make this enormously costly mm. uh, for the Americans, you know, which has you know great effects on why the United States end up you know is using the atomic bomb, doesn't really hesitate to use the atomic bomb uh, to try and change this, and it also affects the way the Japanese look at the defense of the, of the home islands. They know that they can cause enormous casualties to landing forces. Uh, even though the Americans have advantages in every uh, every aspect of of warfare, except for when it turns into a straight infantry fight. Um, so, and, and am, I, 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 am I right in thinking that, as opposed to Guadalcanal, where the Japanese really hadn't been there all that long before U.S. forces arrived, Tarawa is really the first time when United States forces really face dug in. Japanese troops who were prepared complicated defenses. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, the Japanese are very, very good at this. You know, they don't have much, you know, it tells you about how, you know, the, the Japanese are constantly adjusting. You know, the Pacific War is really difficult. I think one of the problems that we have in the big narrative of the Pacific War is we say, you know, after midway, you know, turning point, it's all kind of downhill mm -hmm. from there. Right. Uh, and, you know, that's a, a huge myth and it is if the Japanese don't have you know, the Japanese have limited offensive capability with the loss of the carriers, but their ability to defend the islands is uh, and all of the, the approaches to Japan are are uh, they have lots and lots of capability and they're able to do a lot with a uh, little when it comes to troops. Uh, so you can even see the see it in this case with the large numbers overwhelming uh, advantage in terms of numbers, but they're negated. They're able to negate that by canalizing American forces, forcing them to go, identifying where they're likely to land, uh, either in the case of the atolls where there's not much depth to their positions to be on the beach itself and, uh, and, and have their positions there. Or then later on when they do have a little bit more depth on a little bit bigger islands like Iwo Jima or Okinawa, they go inland and serve and build those same kind of positions to again, make it enormously costly. Uh, they see the American uh, sort of weakness potentially as as uh, that they won't take enormous casualties, and they know that they can inflict a lot of casualties. You know, at least up until the atomic bomb, right? When that when that changes, and they realize right. that the Americans don't have to land in order to cause huge damage. One more thing I would like to talk about with this campaign: um, ordinary Americans would have seen a lot more of what the fighting was like there because uh, a filmmaker issued Ooh. little little movie cameras Ooh. to the uh, to the marines to advance in the hopes of creating a film out of this footage right w what can you tell us about this became yeah, so there were um, of Tarawa. yeah there were multiple correspondents that went along with them and so yes taro ends up being uh well known it, it sort of so I, you know here's here's what i always like kind of try to remind folks about world war ii is that um even though the the leadership of the united states and great britain decide on europe first and the focus on germany and for very good reason uh that they, they have a lot of very good smart reasons for it the american people are generally focused on the pacific right you know the, the precipitating incident of american entry into the war is pearl harbor uh, there's a lot of uh, outrage about that um and and you know, and what I would say is that this kind of steals the resolve even more of people, um, you know, to go on the fight. Now, there is, you know, there is some negative return to it. But uh, one of the things that they're able to do in World War II is uh, the, the military leaders is to show progress. Right. So, you know, there is an advance going on. There is this idea um, that kind of becomes part of the popular imagination of island hopping. And you can kind of picture on a map, even if it's a map you're wildly unfamiliar with, which I suspect most most listeners and certainly most people in the World War II area are of what the, you know, Central Pacific looks like, you can still see that, you know, you're getting closer uh, to Japan itself, which has a way of, so, you know, uh, of saying, yes, it was costly, but it was also successful and it is showing progress. American people tend to support progress uh, war if they can, if they can visualize it. Uh, you know, they, they tend to, you know, not be good about casualties if casualties don't seem to be heading anywhere. Um, yeah, so that's you know, one of the difficulties in counterinsurgency when it's hard to depict progress, yeah. Um, yeah, as you sure. can on a map in this case. So I think that the American, yes, yeah, so the American people see it. They start to see you know, just how rough this war is going to be. Um, the Marines do take a bit of a hit on recruitment um, after after Tarawa, uh, but they end up uh, uh, doing okay. Uh, and the Warriors still have a draft, so there's uh, mm -hmm. a way to get to uh, to get Marines into in into the fight. <laughs> 
uh, but it does go into the sort of uh, the the ongoing like a legend of the Marine Corps is fighting. You know, so much so that you know we're talking about Tarawa and the Gilbert Islands campaign, and we're not talking about Macon because it was an army one. We have a tendency to you know forget the armies in in the Pacific uh, a lot of the time. So, um, but but regardless, it is it is one of those touchstones for the for the Marine Corps and showing just how hard they'll fight. There is, I would add. Uh... A YouTube you can find on YouTube with the Marines at Tarawa, uh, and um, which which I told one, I think best short subs best won the Academy Award for best short subject in 1944. Right, I um, think that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to I, I want to thank you for uh, for joining us today, Doctor Braschino. This was a delightful conversation, and. Um, to all of you who have uh, who have joined us, I appreciate your being here. It's uh, it's it's good to know that we have some uh, some experts who understand a campaign like Tarawa that happened so many years ago, but was so important to the ultimate outcome of the Second World War. So until next time, for the American Idea, I am John Moser. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.